The concept of discourse fatigue, which I'm sure is not new to a lot of terminally online people, is a touchy subject on the internet. By no means is the difficulty of this sort of topic surprising. Social media corporations spent a lot of time and effort poisoning the well, so obviously they wouldn't make it easy to try and fix it with critique. It's a threat to their business model. This difficulty is demonstrated in real time by those who are particularly trigger-happy to claim you're trying to shut them up when suggesting that we need to do something about discourse fatigue. The irony here is that hurling this emotional response is, in and of itself, a form of trying to shut up critics. Regardless, I'm already proving my introductory point about how difficult it is to have this conversation, because if it weren't, I wouldn't feel this preamble is necessary. So what is discourse fatigue? The best way I can define it is as a flavor of habituation. Habituation is a concept in psychology that claims we pay less attention to some types of stimuli with repetitive exposure. There are a lot of different factors that can contribute to habituation, but the first two I'll focus on are recognition and boredom. When you see a logo for the first time, you might require a minute or so to take it in. Once you've seen it enough times, all you need is a quick glance to recognize it, and thus, the stimulus doesn't require as much of your attention. You have habituated to the logo. Now, there are some things in life you've seen many instances of, but may still take time to look at, such as a sunset. So the other factor that comes to play is boredom. Maybe a sunset is interesting to you, but I'm certain it would feel less special to some people if they were watching it daily. They become bored with the stimulus, and then habituate. To see these two aspects of habituation in action with regards to discourse fatigue, a great example is the subreddit r 196. The audience there is rather left-leaning with a large portion of LGBTQ people compared to the average Reddit community. A subreddit of that description lends itself to the tendency to share bigoted content because it's reassuring to post it in a space for those similar to you so you can all dunk on it. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, however, r196 is themed as a meme subreddit. And this bigotry posting eventually became enough of a problem that a new rule was enforced that limited such posts to Saturdays only. This happened for the same reasons that people only need to glance at logos or eventually become bored with looking at a sunset. Many subreddit members on the receiving end of this content were exposed frequently enough that it became easy to recognize a bigotry post with a glance and scroll right past. For Redditors who weren't actively trying to avoid such content, they would eventually habituate because the content frequency made the stimulus, bigotry posts, boring. I mentioned earlier that discourse fatigue is a specific flavor of habituation, and that's due to a factor I've been leaving out until now, emotional strain. The reason I specified earlier that these bigotry posts were being shared in a meme community was because this affects the emotional strain it has on the audience. During the height of this problem, some R196 members were joking about how they would rather not be reminded that a handful of really loud morons want them dead when all they wanted to do is look through transgender cat girl memes and Vosh posts with the special lock award. This meme subreddit has an audience expecting memes, so obviously when your feed is full of posts about how Ron DeSantis would not hesitate to punch you in the crotch to determine if you're allowed to go to the correct bathroom, you close the SNM tab and complain to R196 mods. Jokes aside, emotional strain is that third flavor of discourse fatigue flavored habituation which needs to be accounted for. Those who feel they're being silenced when they're pushed out of communities for causing this habituation fail to understand that discourse is about a balance of two things, presentation and platform. By all means, you can be really emotionally charged and post frequently about topics you're deeply invested in, but be prepared to preach to smaller audiences. That smaller audience isn't because people don't care, it's because the majority of internet users, even those who aren't normies, are online for memes more frequently than emotionally charged political content. Don't take it personally. This is also true outside of the internet. There was a time I had visited my grandmother because she had made my favorite soup, and by the time I sat down with my first cup, she had begun talking about beheaded babies in Israel. Who the fuck starts a conversation like that? I just sat down. In this instance, I'm telling my grandma not to talk about decapitated babies, not because I don't care about what's going on in the Gaza Strip, but because I want to enjoy my damn soup in peace. This isn't any different than a person asking not to see disgusting bigots in their meme community. If we can't keep different types of content separate from each other for people to have control over their media diet, they'll just start to refuse to engage in social activities in general, and that's bad for everyone. It's preferable to sift various types of content into groups based on how triggering it is than to sift people into groups based on who can and can't handle it. I also want to point out that brute forcing emotionally charged content onto large platforms doesn't work either. The terminally political don't like to take no for an answer, and begin to assume that being triggering somehow means people will care more about a subject. We have to be scary, because if we weren't, nobody would do anything. 
This is one of the worst calls to action of modern activism. The far right, for instance, is plenty scared that their preferred way of life is under the threat of degeneracy via leftists and non-whites. The people who believe these things also tend to ideologically agree with, and are capable of, stockpiling firearms. Scaring such a heavily armed group leads to what we have right now in America. Mass shootings where the culprit time and time again has far-right beliefs. This isn't an assumption either. Even according to the ADL's data on this, the far-right is responsible for more fatalities than anarchists and Islamists combined times three. The far-right aren't the only example either. The incel community, who are scared they'll spend the rest of their lives alone and celibate, have not let this fear motivate themselves to be more sociable or work on themselves to be a better romantic partner. Instead, they either enter a deep depression to lie down and rot, or, in the infamous case of Elliot Rogers, commit violence against women. As a final example, this can happen within one's own movement. I was a pretty avid Reddit user until leftist political subreddits were both A, taken over by tankies, and B, increasingly filled with more emotionally charged content than actual discussion. This, and mismanagement by their shite our CEO, led me to delete my account so I could recover from the intense depression that watching people being murdered or deeply wronged all the time left me with. Getting away from frequent emotionally charged content didn't make me care any less. If anything, it gave me the mental well-being to care more since I could actually focus on current events without chipping away at my emotional stability. These examples of harm aside, I've yet to see any evidence that harassing people with this type of rhetoric will get them to do anything compared to relatively less alarmist online figures like Vosh, who's raised money for multiple charities and connected viewers with activist organizations to get more left-leaning people in power. While it's not direct action, charities and Democrats are doing more for the real world than communities who turn themselves into emotional dead ends. The reason I care to put this spotlight on discourse fatigue isn't because I'm trying to paint those who are the source of it as evil people who want us all to be depressed or go out and kill people. I just want them to know that the first expectation of frequent emotional rhetoric should never be efficacy. There are different levels of propaganda for different audiences, and mixing a harder level of propaganda with a more mainstream audience is not the speed run to radicalization some might assume it is. When a hard level of propaganda is preached to the right audience, though, the results are a lot less negative. I see people all the time on leftist Macedon instances using incredibly emotional and hardline rhetoric and simultaneously not getting a bad response to it. This is because they have an audience that's been in the leftist scene for long enough to know that the message's emotional fervor is a result of the original poster's strong emotions on the topic and meant to be taken partially as a vent instead of being entirely propaganda. And that's a good thing. It's healthy to be amongst an audience where you can just be angry sometimes and not feel like you need to tweak a word of what you say to make your post more marketable to a mainstream audience. The problem results from forcing this on said mainstream audience because they will interpret that kind of rhetoric less as a vent piece and more as the movement being hostile and unwelcome to them. If it is somehow your goal to be hostile and difficult to people wanting to join the leftist political movement, or if you think it fair for your audience to be constantly suffering emotionally because groups of people in other parts of the world are, you might want to rethink your coping mechanisms before it begins to overwhelm your community with more depression and anger than they can handle. It should be noted that emotional results of discourse fatigue aren't strictly limited to just depression or anger. Sometimes it results in humor. Take for example the question a lot of Zionists like to ask ad nauseum when conversing with anyone who doesn't agree with them. Do you condemn Hamas? This eventually becomes so repetitive when talking about the happenings in Gaza that people tend to habituate to it in a way that detracts from their ability to solemnly discuss the topic. Instead of that question being treated like one asked in good faith, and let's be honest it usually isn't, it's turned into a punchline. Palestinian refugees make it on the news, and the question, do you condemn Hamas, elicits laughter. A bunch of Palestinians get bombed? Guess they just didn't condemn Hamas enough. The humor is undoubtedly morbid, but this is what happens when an ideologue forces such a point over and over. It results in habituation, and as a way to cope with it, humor. Really, my overarching point here is that discourse fatigue benefits nobody. It doesn't help the people who are the source of it to get catharsis, it doesn't help the communities they force it upon, it doesn't help people take the message seriously, and from a utilitarian standpoint, produces less political efficacy as a result of it becoming more and more of a problem. Is there anything wrong with making fiery political posts and an audience you know can take it with the right heart? No. But that isn't a reason to feign responsibility to your community. If we as leftists truly believe in community self-interest, we mustn't neglect our individual responsibilities to the community. And one of those steps is making sure we don't contribute to discourse fatigue.